Welcome. I am delighted that we've been able to secure Terence Wilson as BCO soloist for Beethoven's Piano Concerto No. 3. Acclaimed by the Baltimore Sun as, quote, one of the biggest pianistic talents to have emerged in this country in the last 25 years, pianist Terence Wilson has appeared as soloist with major symphony orchestras across the U.S., including those of Atlanta, Baltimore, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Dallas, Detroit, Houston, Minnesota, Philadelphia, San Francisco, St. Louis, Washington, D.C., and the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. Enough said. He's also enjoyed an impressive international career as soloist, recitalist, and chamber musician. And I myself have been honored to accompany Mr. Wilson in concerto performances with the Colorado, Winnipeg, and Duluth Symphony Orchestras. Now, it's a great pleasure to bring you Terence Wilson with Jonathan Pilewski. It is my distinct pleasure to have the company of Terence Wilson. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with me. And I'm really looking forward to, to talking to you about a bunch of interesting things. Hi, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'd love to ask you about two events. One happened right before the pandemic in February of 2020, just before everything shut down. And you stepped in for Andre Watts in Detroit. Is that right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's did, right. did you know him? Uh, he was giving a recital one time in the Bronx where I grew up at one of the colleges there. Um, he was giving a recital and I went backstage and and uh, met him. That, so when I had a chance to step in for him with the Detroit Symphony, it was a monumental honor, you know, to be asked to do that. But <laughs> one is aware <laughs> in a situation like that, that there are patrons uh, you know, that we're expecting to hear Andre Watts. And so, you know, um, there's a certain level of expectation that comes with that. And yeah, you know, this had better be good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, you are from the Bronx and you ended up going to Juilliard. And one of the things that's interesting about the, all the pianists that I'm talking to are the amount of Russian teachers and instruction that seems to pervade this world. I, I, I have to say that I have been blessed to have had um, a wealth of mentors. Uh, Are you teaching now? Do you have uh, ambitions so, to do this? Not, not so much now. Um, you know, since the pandemic, my teaching has kind of faded out. Um, I'm using the time to learn as much repertoire as I can and uh, do some, you know, I guess, introspective practicing, I guess you could call it. Any particular <laughs> repertoire that uh, obsesses you right now? Well, you know, I go through these phases where I'm, I'm like really into the, you know, a particular composer as if there were none other uh, <laughs> in the world. Um, and, um, but right now, um, uh, I guess you could say I'm on kind of a, a Bach and, and Rachmaninoff, two different styles, mm -hmm. of course, um, but I'm on a Bach and Rachmaninoff thing right now where I'm exploring the complete oeuvre of Rachmaninoff more in depth than I did. You know, I learned, I learned a lot of the preludes when I was younger and the etudes and, of course, the second sonata and and the piano concertos um but you know I, I go through these phases in life when i feel like i've arrived at a certain point in my life where something clicks with the language and the style of a composer that may not have felt as natural um or maybe i just at that particular point i didn't feel as blessed with um uh, with a particular insight or a particular um, inspiration that's as hot as it is uh, now of his hands uh, weighs uh, into that um, inevitably. However, I think there's something in this in the in the style of of romanticism, or at least that kind of romanticism that has something to do with 
like striving for something that's unattainable. So when you have a certain challenge, maybe your hands are not that big. Um, <laughs> maybe it lends itself to that element of striving for, you know, striving through that challenge to attain something mm -hmm. um, that could add something to, you know, the performance of, you know, Alicia de la Rocha, um, was not all that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was not all that grand in stature, yeah. Um, uh, but she played Rachmaninoff third at least at some point in her life. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you know, I would, I would bet that that would be one of the most <laughs> powerful uh performances, uh, of Rachmaninoff third piano concerto, you know, nicely um, done, yeah, you know, well said. So, um there's something about the time of right now that uh, that speaks to me about Bach's music. I've always sort of looked at Bach as I don't know, like the, the you know the Old Testament, <laughs> mm -hmm. or Hebrew <laughs> and the, Bible, and the Beethoven and the Beethoven sonatas are the New Testament. You know, mm -hmm. especially when we find ourselves in a, times like now. These are particularly just really tumultuous times, just the whole atmosphere right now, the whole uh, spirit of the time seems to call Bach to me, I think now. It definitely elevates the spirit for me. And that's in stark contrast to Rachmaninoff, which has the same kind of immediacy in its effect emotionally. I was thinking if Bach is the Old Testament and Beethoven the New Testament, is Rachmaninoff the Apocrypha in some ways? <laughs> uh, and, and, and... For me, um, Rachmaninoff is almost, I dare say, um, almost um, autobiographical <laughs> ah. for me in, in, in an intuitive musical sense because, uh, because, well, for one thing, I feel that my natural intuitive understanding um, and my comfort level in playing Rachmaninoff's music has been very natural, really from the beginning. Um, he, the, the style of his music has, has not been something that I've had to sort of grow into um, as I've had to grow into Mozart, for example, mm. or grow into, into Bach. I don't know how tall you are, and I don't know if your hands were the size of his, but chances are very few people had his massive hands. And mm -hmm. uh, I think Stravinsky called him six feet of gloom. Uh, <laughs> because, and you always see him in these dour pictures, which his music mm -hmm. is anything but dour. But do, do the fact that, that he had a particularly unique set of hands, does it matter in his music or, or is that just not important? He was a, he was a great pianist in his own right. Um, so of course, a lot of his music he wrote to, to you know, he tailored it to suit his own abilities. Um, and um, obviously uh, the span of his hands uh, weighs uh, into that. So, you know, Alicia de la Rocha um, was not all that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was not all that grand in stature, but she played Rachmaninoff third, at least at some point in her life. I would, I would bet that that would be one of the most <laughs> powerful uh, performances uh, of Rachmaninoff third piano concerto, you know. Yeah. It's with great trepidation uh, that I'm, I'm going to ask you about the fire. Oh, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if, uh, if, I, I, I mean, so, so I play a tiny instrument, as you can see. You play a very large, massive piece of furniture. Um, uh, but yet, people bond with their pianos, and to lose a piano, uh, I can't even imagine what that was like. That that was pretty rough. It was not my best piano I've ever owned. It wasn't my prized Fazioli. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, uh, Do you have a prized fazioli? No, no, Not I don't. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> no, I don't. Angela Hewitt's um, prized fazioli was, was I know. dropped and destroyed. I, that's well, that's what came to mind um, yeah. when I was telling this story. This is a nice segue into talking about the Mendelssohn. It's not a piece I I uh, knew at all until I uh, you know had the pleasure of becoming uh, acquainted with it and. Mm -hmm. 
it's kind of a little mini masterpiece. I asked you about your recording of it, which is in a, I guess, a compilation of a whole bunch of people playing various pieces at a festival. And you, and you said you weren't particularly thrilled with the performance. I thought it was really quite lovely. What were, what were your reservations? <laughs> well, um, I, the way I happened on the stage was uh, slightly hair raising because uh, I remember it was the first day of the festival and uh, I think there was some inclement weather on that day and I was coming in on the same day. Uh, I, was, I, I was not coming in the day before for whatever reason. Um, I think it was probably a s scheduling uh, uh, hiccup that happened. But I remember being frazzled and getting right off the train and literally rolling onto that stage <laughs> without any time to compose myself. Yeah. <laughs> and that's one hell of a piece, you know, to just sort of jump. Um, I think I think had I not been so um, frazzled, um, I might have been able to create more of an atmosphere in that very beginning, in that very opening, because it, you know, it's, it's a very remote F know we're talking, you know, and um, there's a certain uh, of, of mystery in the atmosphere and the way that piece begins. And I might, and I might have played the presto with the same intensity, just not as fast. <laughs> mm, mm. It was very because, exciting. <laughs> because speed does not create, speed per se does not create the, uh, the intensity. <laughs> it was pretty exciting. Uh, I appreciate that. Well, I'm glad you found it to be exciting. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just a little footnote. Um, what inspired me to play this piece was um, the great pianist Anton Querti. And I just remember just being spellbound, riveted <laughs> by his performance of this piece. I mean, it was no nonsense um, from that very mysterious um, atmospheric opening that I described to the piercing you know, agogic cadence, <laughs> you know, at the very end. <laughs> um, that just, I, I just remember jaw being to the floor, you know. And, um, you know, I've been trying to recreate <laughs> that, that intensity ever since I heard him play at that time so many years ago. Nice. Well, thank you for mentioning a fellow Canadian. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. I want to thank you very much for spending a bit of time with us. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I've learned a lot and enjoyed the experience. Uh, and we now have the pleasure of hearing you play Mendelssohn's uh, F sharp minor fantasy, the so-called Scottish fantasy. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Terrence Wilson, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me.
So looking forward to hearing Terence Wilson performing Beethoven's third piano concerto with Baltimore Chamber Orchestra in our 2021-2022 season. And now, join us in two weeks on April 11th for the next BCO Sundays at 3, as Rebecca Smithorn breaks down Beethoven's sublime piano concerto number 4 for us. <laughs>